Hey, Merry Christmas, everyone. We're so glad that you're spending some time with us watching this video online. My name is Joel Larison. If we haven't met before, I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Bridgeway. A few things about Bridgeway I'd love to let you know is that we are a community of faith where you can belong before you believe. So no matter what your relationships look like, no matter what your boss said about you last week, no matter what your background with faith and spirituality is, we make space for you to join us and to discover Jesus and discover your next step with us. So we're so glad that you're here. Another thing that we say all the time is that we are a community where there are no perfect people allowed at all. We make space for anybody and everybody because we are all people in process. So during this video, we're going to experience a song together, then I'm going to give a message, and I hope that's encouraging and uh, challenging to you no matter where you are on your journey, and that we can celebrate Christmas together through a screen wherever you are this holiday season. So enjoy. years before the birth of Jesus on planet earth, the prophet Isaiah said these words, 
And you might have heard them many, many Christmases over and over and over again. This is what he says. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We all need light, don't we? We all love light. I mean, we need light from the sun to keep us warm, to keep us alive, to keep vegetation going on planet Earth. We need light from our cars so we can drive at night. That way we don't end up in a ditch. I mean, light brings us joy. I mean, we are in the darkest season of the year, right? We're seasonal affective disorder. It really affects us, and it makes millions of people depressed. Uh, Take, for example, I've been in quarantine for like seven days straight because I had a contact with somebody with COVID, and I was living in a room all by myself. And when I finally got to experience the sun again, I could smile again. It was that great of a thing. Uh, I need light around our house. Our two-year-old Jack in his playroom, uh, he'll dump blocks all over the place. And if I don't turn the light on, I step on a block and I invent a new curse word, and it's not a good thing. Uh, We all need light, and light is a powerful thing. Isaiah tells us here, though, that the people were walking in darkness. The people are walking in darkness, and they have seen a great light. I'm pretty sure I don't need to convince you, or it doesn't take a lot of convincing, to tell you that we live in a world that's very dark. I mean, over just the year 2020, it's been layered darkness over and over and over again. I mean, there's darkness that's just, we can just call it evil, right? There's been this pandemic that's been a blanket over everything that we've done. There's this divisive political season and election cycle, racial strife and racial injustice that led to riots in our streets, economic downturns, recession, shootings, school shootings, divorce, slavery. These things are evil, so there is darkness in our world. I don't need to convince you of that, but there's also a different kind of darkness. There's an ignorance on how we can actually fix it, how the world can actually get better. So we turn to lots of things to try to make the world better, right? We we turn to a great economy. If we could just have an incredible economy where there's enough to go around, then there would be no more darkness, we often think. We think we can turn to the government. If we have the right person at the table leading us, then there'll be no more darkness. Or we turn to technology thinking that, man, if we just have this next breakthrough in technology, there'll be no more darkness. People will actually actually find happiness and fulfillment, but it just doesn't work that way. And this is the first message of Christmas, I think, that we can't really just walk by. Uh, that It's the bad news of Christmas, we can call it that. That, that Christmas, it's not sentimental, it's not um, optimistic blindly, but the bad news of Christmas tells us that things really are this bad. Things really are this dark. I'm really this bad. I can be this dark, and there's nothing that I can do to fix it. There's nothing that we can do to fix it. Christmas It's not blindly optimistic. The bad news of Christmas is that there is darkness that we are all living in. But Isaiah, he he brings us a sense of joy, a sense of expectation and hope in the next verse. He says, On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders." Isaiah gives us this great news that there is a light that is dawning. It's appearing. It is showing up. And this light is something that comes from outside of me. It comes from outside of us. You know, in our American Western way of looking at the world, we think, man, we just need to work harder. We can earn something. We can create something that can save us. But Isaiah says, no, there is a light that has dawned. It has appeared. It is outside of us. And he goes on to say it is above us, it is beyond us, when he says that the government will be on his shoulders. By that, he's really saying that if you are looking to a man, you're looking to a political system or the way that we order power to really bring us light from our darkness, you're looking in the wrong place. Because this power, this light that is coming, it's bigger than the power of the government. It's above and beyond the power of the government in our systems. And it's not going to be relying on those things at all. This child that's going to be given to us outside of our doing, oh man, it's going to be beyond these powers. And this is where light is really going to flood the darkness. He continues on and he starts to describe what this child, this son that has been given to us, what he will be called. In verse 6, he says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I'd like to talk just for a few moments about these four names and what they meant and what they can mean for us 
this Christmas season as we're celebrating this light that is dawning on us in our darkness. The first name that Isaiah gives him is Wonderful Counselor. And the phrase Wonderful Counselor in the original language in the Hebrew, it's Pele Yahweh. Pele means wonderful. It's beyond understanding and comprehension. Amazing, too amazing for words. And Counselor is the phrase Yahweh, someone who guides, somebody who advises from a place of authority and wisdom. You know, just like today and in the ancient world, counselors were people that were looked at with suspicion. They were advisors that would be at the right hand of somebody in power, somebody in leadership, and often they were making their own house of cards style play for authority and for power, and so they weren't trusted. But not this counselor, not this wonderful counselor that we see in Jesus. Jesus says, hey, if you've got problems, if you've got issues, uh, you're actually right in the right place for me to come in and do my incredible work because I've got your best interest at heart and I want to lead you to the way of life everlasting and abundant. But Jesus says, if you've got problems, you're in the right spot, the perfect position to experience my love and my presence. You see here, if you have a season of confusion on the horizon, if you're in a season of confusion, uh, the wonderful counselor offers you wisdom. If you're in a season of weariness, of being tired, of being down and out, which so many of us are during this crazy year, Jesus, this wonderful counselor, offers you strength. You know, one of the powerful things about counseling is that we've got to act on it so that, that we can actually move forward to a healthier version of ourselves. And one of the greatest gifts of God's grace in my life over the last couple of years has been going to counseling, going to a trusted therapist who can give me sort of the bird's eye view of my life and speak truth to me when I'm not seeing it or when I need to hear it the most. But the reality is that I could hear all the greatest advice. I could be like, yeah, that sounds good. But if I don't take a step into the direction that my counselor is asking me to, um, I stay exactly the same. <laughs> And that's the reality with this wonderful counselor as well. The invitation of the wonderful counselor in your life is to trust him that he is for you and that he's got your best interest in his mind. And maybe it doesn't look like what you think your best interest should be, but this wonderful counselor, he has the long view, the long play, and he wants to lead you to a life everlasting. The next phrase that Isaiah uses, the next name that Isaiah uses for this light that is dawning, this baby boy Jesus, is mighty God. And when I hear the word mighty, um, I'll just show my cards about how big of a nerd I am. I think back to like the 90s and superheroes that I watched on TV, like the mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Yeah, I'm that kind of a nerd. Or, you know, the mighty Avengers, mighty Thor, any of the characters from Star Wars. I mean, I just love these epic, big stories. And I love these superheroes and all the powers that they have. But you know what? As the older I get, I think I realize that all these superheroes that I've looked up to and I've been, just been captivated by their stories, um, they're all just shadows. They're all just signposts or echoes of the truest hero who ever lived, Jesus. You know, you think about what really makes a hero, what makes a superhero. It's not actually their superpowers because villains in these stories ha often have superpowers as well. But it's the reality that these superpowers, these superheroes use their powers for the good, for leveraging and empowering other people to rescue people that can't rescue themselves. That's what makes somebody mighty. It's using their powers for somebody else. And this is exactly what we see Jesus doing, this light that is dawning on our darkness. This is what he does. In the Exodus story back in the Old Testament, we see that God's people, the Israelites, were enslaved by the Egyptian empire for 400 years, thinking that there was no hope for them. But God heard their cry, sent a couple incredible leaders to lead them out of slavery to the promised land. And there's this beautiful moment after they've escaped the Egyptian pharaoh and all his forces. They're out in the wilderness on the path to the promised land, and they break out into a song. And they start celebrating the mighty right hand of our God has saved us. Fast forward about 5,000 years, and Jesus' mother, Mary, has this crazy encounter with this angel, this messenger from God, telling her that she is going to give birth to the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And she is terrified, she is confused, and later she crosses that bridge from confusion to wonder. And she says, she doesn't just say, actually, she has to break out into a song where she says that the Mighty One has done great things for me. 
This is what the mighty God does. I don't know what your circumstances are uh, today. I don't know what brokenness you have in your life, what needs healing, what needs fixing, but I do know this, that the mighty God, the light that is dawning on the world in Jesus has power, has power to restore what's broken. This Jesus has power to forgive relationships and forgive your brokenness, power to heal you in ways that you didn't even think were possible, that you just dreamed about. The mighty God wants you to trust him with your brokenness, with whatever your circumstances are, that he is for you and he will use his power for you. The next name that Isaiah gives, this light that's dawning, this sun that is given to us at Christmas is everlasting father. It probably doesn't take a lot of convincing for me to tell you that the father relationship is one of the most vital relationships we have as human beings. I mean, the research shows us that 71% of all high school dropouts don't have a stable father figure at home, and 98% of all discipline problems in our schools come from kids that don't have a stable father figure at home. And maybe you're listening to this, and you have a great relationship with your dad, with your father, and you should thank God for that. But the reality is that many of us have, let's just say, complicated, messy relationships with our Father, and oftentimes that mirrors how we see our Heavenly Father as well. I mean, for example, maybe you, your complicated relationship with your earthly father is he's the never satisfied dad. It didn't matter what you did, it was never enough. They never spoke those powerful words to you, oh, I'm so proud of you. They were more like a taskmaster, master, just asking you to do more and more things so that they could, you know, have approval on your life, but you could never quite grasp it. Well, this, this everlasting father is nothing like that at all. When the prophets in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Zephaniah wrote this in Zephaniah 3.17, he says, God will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I mean, I want you guys to hear this today, that your heavenly father is crazy about you. He doesn't just love you because he's supposed to love you. He loves you with this overflowing love because he is wild about you. And listen to this. He doesn't just love you. I believe that our heavenly father, he likes you. He likes the way that you are. He created you in this unique design. And just like the never satisfied dad is a taskmaster who's always asking you to do more and more for his approval, the everlasting father says you are a precious treasure. You're not just some task list, but you are a precious treasure the way that you are. Maybe for you, you have a father relationship where your father was the emotionally distant dad. I mean, he was around, things were stable at home, but he wasn't ever open with you with his emotions and the way he feels about you. And maybe for you, those words, I love you, weren't words that were used liberally around your home. Well, (laughs) this everlasting father is so different than that. Uh, One of Jesus' closest friends, a guy by the name of John, near the end of his life, he said this about God's love. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I love that phrase, lavished on us, because it doesn't mean that we get just the minimum amount of love. We don't get the minimum requirement of love. But no, this is love that is lavished on us in a sloppy way, spilling over the brim, overflowing. This is the way that our Heavenly Father loves us, and he calls us his children. In a story that Jesus told once, it's called the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, There's this son who asks for his inheritance, basically says, forget you, family. I'm going to take all my money and I'm going to go party. He parties and wastes all his money and squanders and he comes groveling home to his family just to see if he could have a place to lay his head in peace. And the father sees him from a distance. And what does the father do? Does he pick up a rock to stone his son? Does he shame his son and tell him to go someplace else? No. The father does something unexpected. The father runs towards the wayward son. He runs. Now, men during this time in the world, they were never caught dead running. It was an undignified act. But this father, who was representing God in his heart, runs after his son. He's emotionally available. He's lavish with his love and his care for his son. This is the way that God loves us. He's an everlasting father who shows us his raw emotions who put his life on the line, his blood on the line, his love on the line for you and for me. He's not the emotionally distant dad. Maybe for you, in your experience, you think about your relationship with your father, it's the absent father thing. It's the absent dad thing. 
And maybe they're no longer with you because they've passed away, or maybe they were just never really there as you were growing up. You know, the light of Jesus, the the arrival of Jesus demonstrates that he is so different. It demonstrates that he is a present, faithful love in your life and for you. He's everlasting, never leaving. Think about it this way. Jesus went to the cross even though you and I and all of his followers had rejected him and turned their backs on him and his way. He still went there for you. There's nothing you can do to shoo him off away from you because he is after you and he is that faithful with his presence. I mean, Christmas shows us that the light of the world left the splendor of heaven to be near to you, to be near to me. He's not absent, but he is present with us in every moment. That is who the everlasting father is. The last name for Jesus that Isaiah gives us is Prince of Peace. And peace, doesn't that just feel like a silly word at this point in the year, right? I mean, it feels so elusive to us with the racial unrest, protest, a brutal election cycle, stirring so much division in this pandemic that's just sort of overarching everything and the depression, the anxiety, and the stress that we're all feeling living in this crazy new normal. I mean, it feels impossible, right? To have tranquility, to be okay with everything that's going on around you. But the peace spoken about in the scriptures is a bigger idea than just, hey, it's all good, peace signs up, right? The word that's used in the scriptures for peace is the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom is not just everything's good. Shalom is a beautiful, power-packed word. And it means that this is God's dream for the world. It means that everyone living in harmony with their maker, living in harmony with their neighbor, it's like the whole world is dancing in rhythm to God's heartbeat. And everything has wholeness and completion inside of it. Doesn't that sound good? I mean, can we just be honest? Doesn't that sound like too good to actually be true? You know, in the ancient world, peace was a thing, but it was something that had to be fought for. There had to be violence. There had to be bloodshed for one nation to secure peace uh, for their people. But that's not the way that Jesus brings peace. The Prince of Peace, he brings peace by his presence, Because peace is not just an idea or a state of mind. Peace is the presence of a person, and that person is Jesus. When we do life with Jesus, when we walk with Jesus, we experience peace, wholeness, harmony. And this Prince of Peace, he offers wholeness that can't be shaken no matter who's in office, no matter what the Dow Jones industrial average is, no matter what the latest COVID numbers look like. Peace can be found when we walk with Jesus because peace is in the presence of a person that we can believe in, trust in, walk side by side with, and that is what the Prince of Peace offers us. You guys, my prayer, my hope for you this holiday season and as we head into a new year is that you would let the light of the world shine on whatever darkness you're experiencing this Christmas that you would let the light of the world shine as a wonderful counselor, that you would let Jesus guide you into his way, trusting that he's got your best in mind, that you would let the mighty God give you his power to rescue and restore your brokenness, that you would trust the everlasting father, the perfect father with his faithful and protective hand over your life, and that you would walk with the prince of peace to find wholeness and harmony in his presence no matter what the circumstances are are around you. That is the invitation of Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, you are the light that shines in the darkness. You are with us. You are for us in our hurts, in our brokenness, in our doubts, in our confusion, in our questions, in our grieving. You are with us and you are for us. So Father, we thank you that you see our darkness, but you don't leave us to our own vices, but you insert yourself into our story, and we can have hope. And Father, we recognize that hope is bigger than an idea. It's bigger than an emotion. Hope has a name, and that name is Jesus, and you have come for us, and you are still coming after us because you are crazy about us. Father, may we walk into your light this Christmas and into the following year and never leave your light because your light will never leave us. Everybody agreed and said, amen. Breaking through the-
the silence with glory in the highest the hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms the song on the horizon ringing through the heavens the long-awaited Savior come set the captives free come to set the captives free come set us free for joining us for this digital Christmas experience. My hope and my prayer is that it lifted your spirits and encouraged you on your journey and it reminded you what Christmas is all about. And maybe for you, you'd like to know more about this Jesus that we just talked about. You'd like to know what it looks like to have that Prince of Peace in your life every moment of your life. And for you, we'd love to encourage you to take this next step. And all you have to do is text the word Jesus, yeah, real original, text the word Jesus to 765-375-1883. And myself or somebody from our team will reach out to you, answer any questions you might have, and be a guide to your next steps on your spiritual journey. The only other announcement that I have is that we will not have services on December 27th, but we will be back in person and online January 3rd, and we hope you will join us there. You guys have an awesome Christmas and an incredible new year. Blessings to you.